Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Those who are arriving, come on in. Find there's a few seats right up front here. So uh, we're glad to have you here this morning to hear our special guest, Mr. Sam Bridgman. Um, Sam grew up on uh, in East Chicago, and uh, he uh, had the good fortune of uh, being just an academic as well as athletic standout. And I'm sure he will be sharing with you uh, some of this in his presentation. But uh, being at East Chicago at Washington High School, where he was um, both junior and senior class president, he was captain of the cross-country team, basketball, and track teams, and he was a member of the National Honor Society and president of the band. You had a few things going on when you were in high school. <laughs> And so um, after uh, being offered a scholarship to play basketball at the University of Denver, that's the direction that he headed. He also has a younger brother who uh, goes by Junior. I'm not sure if that's his name, but uh, you might know him as Junior Bridgman, who played uh, 12 years in the NBA. He had a couple of cousins who also played in the NBA, and maybe this morning we'll hear why he didn't play in the NBA, but uh, that, that may come later. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, that was supposed to be funny. Come on, li lighten up a little bit, audience. Thank you. Uh, so uh, inspired by John Rice, who was at that time Dean of African American Studies and the father of Condoleezza Rice. So for some of you, you may not know who Condoleezza Rice is, but she served uh, in President Bush, uh, the President Bush administration, uh, I believe as Secretary of State. And Sam produced a campus public affairs radio program called Black Focus. So while he was uh, in college, he had uh, three programs that were uh, nationally broadcast on NPR and over two dozen that played on the local uh, R&B radio station there, winning the University Community Service Award and Student Athlete Award. Uh, Sam graduated with a BA in communications from the University of Denver and a Master of Science in Financial Services from the American College and Professional Designations of Chartered Life Underwriter. So these are going to be a lot of titles here related to the insurance industry in which he gave his profession, a chartered financial consultant, and a Life Underwriter Training Council Fellow. He began his career as an agent with New York Life in 1985, the year I graduated from college. So, wow, we're about the same age then, and he, look where he is, much more distinguished and retired. <laughs> Maybe I'll get there one of these days. I've got to keep working at it. So he began uh, as an as a agent with New York Life. He moved up. Uh, throughout uh, the years uh, in, in different uh, responsibilities such as uh, training and developing new agents. He had about 200 at, at, uh, under his uh, watch at one point in the Houston area, and he developed several initiatives uh, influencing New York Life Insurance Company worldwide. In 2009, he took on the role of Assistant Vice President for Field Training and Development, working with African American agents around the country for New York Life. And in uh, 2011, Sam was promoted to Corporate Vice President, Zone Training Officer, and was responsible for the training and development of more than uh, 30 offices in 15 states. So he had a pretty big territory. And some of the most important things, though, that you need to know about Sam is to follow, and, and here it is. So after 33 years of service, Sam retired in 2017. Uh, he mentors, continues to mentor a group of trainers for New York Life, and he is married, okay, here comes the important parts, to Yvonne, his wife, who's seated right back there on the back row, so make sure you speak to her on your way out today. And they have four children. 10 grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. Sam and his wife, Yvonne, are certainly leaving a legacy. And please welcome today Sam Bridgman. Sam? Thank you. 
Thank you. Be here with you this morning, and hopefully, uh, you're going to get something of value out of our discussion today. And so, the purpose of me being here is to if I can get this to go the way I want it to go. All right, let's try this again. <laughs> All right, what I want to do is share with you some uh, perspectives that you may not have gotten uh, on some of the current events that we are witnessing in this country today. And uh, from a Christian who happens to be black and a former athlete. And so that's where I'm coming from. And what I'm going to do is take you through three concepts. And we'll talk about those concepts in a minute. But the point that I want to make at the end of this discussion, I want to hopefully strengthen your faith, help your faith to grow that you become a Christian leader, and from that perspective, make a huge difference in our community, wherever you might be. With that said, I want to give you a little bit of background. I'm from East Chicago, and most people think Chicago, Illinois. If I was from East Chicago in Illinois, I'd be out in Lake Michigan, because that's what's next to Chicago. And so East Chicago is a small town in Indiana, not that far from the south side. And as you can see, I didn't do that. As you can see here, we kind of jumped ahead, the steel mills and things in the background. That's where I grew up, where it was heavy industry, big time industry, kind of like what used to be around here. And... Um, I was raised Baptist in a Christian home with uh, everyone singing in the choir. And my parents were very big on an education. And I played basketball for two reasons. One was because I liked the sport. But the other reason was, was that it kept me from being drafted into the street gang. So it was a form of, it was a, I was exempt from the street gangs as long as I was a basketball player. As a matter of fact, they helped protect us because we played in some schools where we needed protection. And we've, I've had a game stop where a stabbing took place, bus was stoned, even with the police protection at the game growing up. So sports was the way out. And my dad was, his model was, if, because he had a, a full-time job, three part-time jobs to, to have, be at a low income level. And he took my brother and I and with him when I was 10 years old and my brother was nine and said, if you don't go to college, this is what you're going to be doing. And so that was our motivation to figure out how to get to college. And he said, I'm not paying for it. You got to figure out how to get there. But if you don't go to college, this is what you're going to be doing. And that was my family there that you just saw. And that was the tall guy with the glasses in the back. All right. The three concepts as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. We're going to talk about that first. Then goals versus desires, and we're going to end up with true change requires a heart change. And that's where we're going to end today. And so I want to start with a story about our little dog at home by the name of Simba. And you see Simba there. And we moved into a home where uh, there's no fence around the property. And so I had to um, get an electronic fence with a collar around Simba's neck. And he learned where the property line was. And so he doesn't go past that point. And so there's the boundary around that property line. And when 
there would be a person that would come or some other animal would come there. He would bark, but he would not go across that line. Even when the collar was taken off, he still wouldn't go across that line. And so my question to you, is the boundary real or imaginary? Real or imaginary? Imaginary, okay. And so, boy, this thing is jumping. I'm not even pressing the button. My question to you or my comment related to that is that that experience is holding Simba back from doing whatever Simba wants to do. Now think about yourself. Is there any experience in your past, individually, even collectively, that's holding you back, that's keeping you from being as successful as you want to be or can be? And as a friend of mine used to say, how big would you dream if you knew you couldn't fail? Think about that. And so, for as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. And so your thoughts, how you see yourself, how you see the past, how you see the future, they control. They control you. And they can either make you be very depressed or very excited. We'll talk about that. And very happy. History. Is it an encourager or a discourager? Now, in this picture, you see Jesse Jackson. Some of you may know who he was. Hopefully, everybody knows who Dr. Martin Luther King is or was. The other person on the right is a guy by the name of Cyrilla McSween. I had the opportunity to meet Jesse Jackson, saw him as a kid because he came to our high school to speak in East Chicago, and then later on as a corporate vice president for New York Life. The guy on the right is named Cyrilla McSween, the first African-American ever hired by a major insurance company 50-some years ago. He forced New York Life to hire him. They didn't even train him. But yet, he went on to be not just the first African-American to work for a major insurance company, he became one of the top agents in the industry. Matter of fact, uh, he is the reason why I'm successful, because he broke the barriers. I stand on his shoulders. And so my question to you is, how you see the past can determine how you see the present and the future. Does his story, Sir Lee McSween's story, does that inspire you, or does it discourage you? Inspires you? Anybody feel frustrated because he had to go through that? Well, hopefully not. But I want to tell you how important that is because in my travels with New York Life, I'm in a southern city and I'm interviewing some African-American agents and I have a lady that I'm talking to that's approximately my age, but we're, we're contemporaries, and she's telling me how tough the business is. And insurance business is not easy to begin with, but she's telling me how tough it is because in this particular city, this is where the slaves came in. And she says, you don't know the history here. There is parts of this town where I cannot do business. They don't do business with black people. And so not knowing anything, I just listened to her. And then five or 10 minutes later, after she left, I got a young gentleman that comes in, didn't grow up there, been there about three years. He's all excited about the business, how well he's doing. And I come to find out he's doing business that she said business can't be done with the people she said, won't do business with them. Which one's right? Which one's right? You can answer. Second one? They're both right because it's how they think. That's my point. How they see the world, how they see the past controls how they see the future. Can you advance it for me? All right, one more time. 
I want you to tune into your thoughts. Because too often we always have in our minds thoughts like, I'm just a student here at Bluefield College. When we use that word just, what do we do? Yeah, you're putting yourself down, right? You're putting yourself down. And so tune into your thoughts because you will hear these kinds of words. Isolate the destructive words like, I'm just this. I'm too tall, too fat, too dark, too light, whatever the case may be. And so isolate the thoughts, stop the thought. Now that's easier said than done. Like, don't think about the color green. So what are you thinking about? The color green, right? Because I brought that up. And so it's tough to stop the thought. So that's why we have to accentuate the positive. We got to think positive. And so I'm hoping I'm talking to a bunch of believers here because when I ask you to think positive, I'm not only asking you to think about positive situations, but I'm asking you to think about the mind of Christ. because That's important to, in terms of where we're going and reorient yourself. And you reorient your thinking by thinking about things above and not things below. That changes things dramatically. How many have had a tough day and all of a sudden a friend calls and says, let's go to lunch or whatever, and your whole attitude changed? Did your circumstance change? No. What changed was how you were thinking. That's why as a man thinks in his heart, so he is, is so important. God wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of the Lord. That's where wisdom starts. That's where our thinking should start. That's how we should handle things. And when believers have the mind of Christ, we understand God's plan for the world and understand that he is bringing about his purpose. His purpose. It doesn't mean that we're infallible and can start playing God in the lives of other people. So what's Christ's perspective? Psalm 11, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we have the pr pr uh, perspective of Christ, then we have a desire to bring glory to God. A longing to provide salvation for sinners. That means we're out there talking to people, sharing our faith. A perspective of humility and obedience. And a compassionate heart. All these are very important for us to have if we're going to not only be believers from the standpoint of exercising our faith, but bringing the gospel to the people that really need the gospel. Now, this slide here, I don't believe in luck, so obviously that means something else. I want to share a little bit about my basketball career in high school. Um, sophomore, I made the varsity, third string. My junior year, I made the varsity, second string. By the end of the season, I'm co-captain and a starter. My senior year, start off second string. Fight, get back to a starter and captain of the team, and we are a pretty good team, break my ankle. So I end up getting a scholarship offer to the University of Denver on the basis of me being able to make the University of Denver basketball team, and the fact that even though I broke my ankle and missed most of the season, I still made all conference. And they also hoped to get my brother to come with me. And so I'm at the University of Denver, and my sophomore year, one of the other guys comes up to me and he says, look, with your jumping ability, switch from playing forward to guard. Now those that play basketball can tell I'm pretty short for uh, a forward. But back then, even in high school, we had a six, seven player. I was the one to jump center for the team. And I'm thinking, I've had difficulty just playing first string on my high school team. How in the world I'm going to play pro? 
and so I blew it off. The year after I graduated from college, the NCAA had three basketball teams get there. They had people from my old high school. Four players from my old high school on those three teams. Two players from my old high school are NCAA national champions. One that year, one the following year, because one redshirted. Out of my old high school, three players, two played in the NBA, one could have played in the NBA, he decided to play Major League Baseball, and he ends up being a pitcher in the World Series. My crosstown rival that we beat each other's brains out each year, they sent a guy to the pros. And between the two schools, we had seven All-Americans. My senior year, I was one of three seniors that graduated, and we got beat by our crosstown rivals who went on to win the state championship. My old team, minus me and the two other people, they win the state championship the following year, 29-0 and 0 for the season. Now, those that understand basketball, how many high school teams average 91 points a game? How many high school teams beat a team 120 to 60? That team made Sports Illustrated that year. It's considered one of the greatest high school basketball teams in the history of the state of Indiana. The whole team is in the Hall of Fame. I thought basketball was like that everywhere. And so when I got to the University of Denver, I said, these people don't play basketball, they're a hockey school. So my point is, I let my past control how I saw the present and the future. And so this stands for, that's me by the way, back when I was at the University of Denver. And that's my brother. You might recognize the guy in the bottom left corner. And if you Google 1971 East Chicago Washington Senators YouTube video, there's a video on that team. The team of the ages is the name of the YouTube video. So LUX stands for labor under correct knowledge. That's what that stands for, labor under correct knowledge. And so how do we do that? One of the wisest men that ever lived, a guy by the name of Solomon, which we've been quoting him already, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. He also said this, where there is no counsel, the people fail or fall. But in the multitude of counsels, there is safety. And so what I'm saying is, you need to have people in your life that you trust, that care about you, that are willing to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear, and be able to take that criticism sometimes, or even encouragement, and realize maybe I'm not looking at the world the way I should be looking at it. So that's why it's so important to have people within the college, people outside of the college. But even with that, you need to temper the advice that you get biblically. Because that's the ultimate God wisdom that we looked at earlier. Because it ain't what you don't know that hurts you. It's what you know that ain't so. It wasn't what I didn't know about basketball that hurt me. It's what I thought I knew that wasn't quite right. And so maybe I should have worked on my ball handling a lot more. Coming out of that background, because at the time, that's all I knew. I only had one person to make a comment. So labor under correct knowledge. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit. If we can advance it for me here. We're going to talk about goals. Now, how many athletes in here? Raise your hand. All right. How many, 
have a goal of like winning the championship. Anybody? Okay. Non-athletes. Is it a good goal maybe to raise successful children? Who would disagree with that? How about a good goal to have a successful marriage? Anybody disagree with that? Well, folks, I'm here to tell you that all three of those are lousy goals. Why are they lousy goals? Any idea? Those are desires. Because they're a lousy goal because somebody else has a say so. Another quick basketball story. I have two daughters, both named Jackie. Both named Jackie, and they're about four years apart. Both basketball players. Both took their team to the state championship. Both lost by three points because the guard made a bonehead play at the most critical time of the game. The younger Jackie, who was a freshman that did this, the guard hallucinated because she had taken something and threw the ball to a non-existent player with a minute to go down by one point. And I'm still upset about that, <laughs> which defeats what I'm gonna say next. My point is, we went back and we looked at, because uh, we had put on the back of her bedroom wall door, the um, list of goals and achievements. Rebounding, points, block shots, because she played the post, guard skills, but a post player. She achieved all of that except the one of winning the state championship. And so a goal, people, is something that you have control over. Everything else is a desire. It's a desire to win the championship because you're dependent upon everybody pulling their weight. It's a desire to be in a good marriage. The best you can do is be the best that you can be as a spouse. But you have no control over how the other person responds. And the same thing when you have children. And so, In his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. And we have to understand that. That's why it's so important to understand the difference between goals and desires. And seek first his kingdom. So where should our focus be in the first place? And so be the very best version of yourself. That should be the goal, that you're the very best version of yourself that you can possibly be. And... That's something that you can control. And once you understand that, then the key thing is this. You work on your goals, you pray for your desires. You work on your goals and you pray for your desires. And obviously, your desires need to be within the will of the Lord. Now, as easy as that sounds, when we confuse the two, which we do all the time, high level of frustration because we expect our spouse, we expect somebody to respond to us in a certain way and when that doesn't happen then we get disappointed and we get upset. Did we have any control over that to begin with? No. We really didn't. And so we get angry and then we begin to seek excuses we want to blame somebody else. And when we don't have anybody else to blame, we sometimes get even more frustrated than that. So that's why it's so important to understand how we think, understand how we think, and then understand the difference between goals and desires. Now, society also doesn't understand the difference between goals and desires. Because society tries to legislate morality. 
they try to force people to do the right thing, right? And so, just like parents set down rules, so society tries to do the, ex the same thing. Let's see. I don't know why it works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. Truth is relative. Things are feelings driven today. Now, my son, who also was an athlete, football player, and he's a good basketball player, but he didn't get my height. He did get my jumping ability. Um, one time he told me about how the teacher told him that truth was relative. And I told him, this was like junior high school, I said, look, if you're wearing the wrong colors in the wrong place at the wrong time, you're dead. And I'm talking about gang colors. Now, when death becomes relative, then I'll listen to your teacher. To me, death is absolute. That's what you're dealing with. You don't have the luxury of playing this silly mind game that I can believe and make whatever I want to be because you will be dead. So that was one serious conversation that we had. We'll have another here I'll tell you about a little later. And so, we don't have that opportunity. That is not a, a Christian belief to begin with. Wow, this thing is not working. Here's the real problem, the heart of man. From within, uh, from within out of the heart, man comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, evil, slander, pride, foolishness. And you can read the rest of that for yourself. In our society today, there's a lot of people who don't even believe evil exists. Sin doesn't exist. Therefore, we don't need God. We don't need him. We can, we can legislate morality and make people do what they need to do. But that does not work. We don't see people being made in the image of God. That's huge. We don't see people being made in the image of God. And we fail to love our neighbor as ourselves. Wrong and perceived wrongs dominate us. Whether that wrong was committed by somebody we know or by a group, even in the past, way in the past. It may not have directly affected us, but that group of people is wrong. Because we don't see ourselves made in the image of God. So it makes it real easy to demonize an individual or demonize a group of people when that happens. And that's happening a lot in our society today. True change requires a heart change. And what it really requires is the gospel. That's what it really requires. Because nothing else is going to change a person's heart, really. And so we're going to start here, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Most people's conversations are in the past. I want you to kind of listen to yourself sometimes as you go about doing your things during the day and how much of the conversations are in the past. What happened? How about that basketball game or whatever took place? And so the statistics show 85% of it's in the past. If I can get this to go, it's 10% in the present, only 5% in the future. And we're going to talk about how leaders actually change that racial. They make a big difference. And because our thoughts are so stuck in the past, we end up crucifying ourselves all the time between two thieves. Regret of the past. Fear of the future holds us back, holds us back a lot. 
I like this quote from um, Joel Osteen. Fear and faith have something in common. They both ask us to believe in something we cannot see. So living the gospel through Christian leadership. And so a good leader, a good leader learns from the past, but the good leader doesn't stay in the past, doesn't focus on the past. And a good leader has good advisors, as we talked about earlier, in terms of people that he or she is willing to trust and gives good advice to her. They learn from the past and they're visionary, so they're looking to the future. And in turn, they're good communicators. They invite others to join them in their message, what they're trying to accomplish. And they understand that there's going to be breakdowns, like this thing I'm trying to press here. <laughs> and the outcome is the Lord's goals versus desires. They understand that there's going to be breakdowns. And so Christian leadership, that's what we're all about. We're about learning from the past, yes, but looking to the future, then working today to get a commitment to work towards that future. And that future from a spiritual standpoint is to be saved and go to heaven. That's, it doesn't change if you're doing that or a leader in business. It's the same process. Your motivation should be right. The greatest leader of all time, Jesus Christ. If you look at what he did, he knew the past, he knew the Old Testament, he knew what was going on in society. Obviously, he was a visionary because he looked about, told everybody about the kingdom, and he invited people to join in with him to change the world. So he is the model. So we are called to be light salt and light. And if you read many of the people in the Bible, when they were called by God, they resisted. Found all kinds of excuses. I think of Moses off the top of my head, as well as a few others. And they needed proof, like Gideon, before they would venture. But we're all called to be salt and light. No special skills are required. So we all have what it takes to do what we need to do to be called by the Lord. Do we have a willingness to do it, a willingness to become a Christian leader? Because what is at stake? This is what's at stake. Society focuses on the police. Is the police the problem or a symptom of the real problem? That's my question. You don't have to answer that. I'm going to answer it for you. This is Daniel Patrick Monahan. Come on now. And Monahan, back in 1965, wrote a report. And in that report, at that particular point in time, 20% of all babies born to black people were born out of wedlock, no dads around. And uh, he predicted it would devastate the community if not addressed. He got tortured for that. He was called a racist. He said the report was wrong. That wasn't what was going on in the community. None of that was happening, and they blistered him. Today, it's over 70%. Now think about that. Over 70% of all black babies that are born alive don't have a dad around. And we know statistically that single-parent homes the children in single parent homes have a higher probability of behavioral problems, difficulty in school, dropping out of school, and becoming involved in activities that get them into the justice system. So here I want to show you some statistics that nobody talks about. The Washington Post database for fatal police shootings. I went back to as far as I could go to 2019, 2019 when I did this. And so over that five-year time period, 1,179 
African-Americans was killed at the hands of the police, whatever the reason. Let's just make the assumption that every single one of those was a bad shoot. Make that a given. Over there to the right, during that same, not even during that same time period, because I only go back four years instead of five years, 11,429 black people were murdered. Nobody's saying a word about that. Of the 11,000 murdered, 10,000 were murdered by other black people. You look down there on the bottom, for each of those years that I was able to get some statistics from the uh, FBI, almost 40% of all murders are black people killing black people. So if black lives really matter, why is, are, why is everybody silent on this issue? So based on what you hear in the news that took one year, where is the most dangerous place for a black person in this country? Encounter with the police? I would say no. And in my lifetime, <coughs> I know no one that died at the hands of the police. <coughs> when I was in junior high or elementary school, my great aunt was murdered. When I was in junior high, one of my guys on the basketball team's brother was poisoned to death. Another kid I know was shot. And another friend of mine that had a, was shot. But I don't know anybody got murdered uh, at the hands of the police. So, trying to put that into perspective. <coughs> the neighborhood, you know, you would think the neighborhood, because of what I just shared with you, would be a very dangerous place. And it is. But it's still a no. Because you take a look at the numbers just for one year. The most dangerous place for a black person in this country is the womb. In 2017 alone, 295,000 black babies were murdered. If you go back to 2008 up to 2017, 3,454 black babies murdered. Anybody hear anything about that on the news? So I say again, if black lives matter, why are we silent? If you add the incarceration of African Americans, we have lost a whole generation. Nobody's saying a word. A whole generation is gone. The stakes are high. So, a review real quick. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Wisdom. And you need the counselors. You can see what's on there, up on the screen there. But I want to read this last part, so I want to make sure I get it right. That's why I say that true change, is, is what we went through, is dependent upon a heart change. And when we take the knee in protest, what do we accomplish? In many ways, we just harden positions. What we need to do is be softening hearts and changing people's minds from the inside out, not the outside in. And so my question to you, Back in the 60s, when I was growing up as a teenager, the mantra was either you're part of the solution or you're part of the problem. That's the way we looked at things back then. And I believe as believers, you're called to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Which through the work of the Holy Spirit, we change hearts. 
We don't really do it. We're just the vehicle by which it may happen if the Lord so sees fit to do that. And so protecting and making us feel good for a moment if we protest. And I get protesting. I've done my share of protesting. And I can tell you some crazy stories when I was in college, which I will not do. So my question to you is, will you pursue the mind of Christ, first taking responsibility for yourself and how you see the world and the things that we just talked about and be the very best person that you can be according to the mind of Christ, trusting in the Lord for the outcome? Or are you going to operate and continue to do as the world does? Accuse abused, whatever the case may be. And say, so are you the one, and that's what I'm asking here, are you the one to bring about the change you're looking for through following Jesus Christ? Because that's what's needed. And folks, when you take a look at those statistics in the black community, we're dying. And nobody is addressing the real issue. And the example I want to leave you with is, think of a bathtub full of water overflowing, spilling on the floor. You come in and you start mopping the floor. What good is that going to do if you don't turn the water off? So focusing on the police to me and some of these other things is mopping the floor. We got to turn the water off. How do we turn the water off? We got to change this mentality that allows 70% of the babies to be born out of wedlock. We got to change that. Only the heart's going to change that. No law is going to change it because right now nobody's forcing anybody with a gun to have a baby out of wedlock. And the same with everything else that we're dealing with. And we can't be upset if a group of people doesn't respond to us the way we think they should. Goals versus desires. And so are you the one? Questions? Comments? Questions? Still awake? No one has a comment one way or the other? Okay, thank you. So what can you do today to make a difference? Now if somebody doesn't speak up, I'll start calling on folks. What could you do today to make a difference? Be the best you. How many people, when you walk into a restaurant, or you know, today, even though it might be difficult more than in the past, and the person say, can I help you, or how are you doing, what do you normally say back to them? Good. Yeah, good. But when you say, how are you, do you really mean it? Does it come across that way? I'll give you one suggestion. Because people are hurting, and not just in the black community, the people are hurting. And so sometimes when you feel, hopefully after today, motivated, that person in front of you, you ask, well, how are you doing today? And the next question is, depending on their response, and I just was having a physical done, and I asked the lady, how is she doing? She said, you know, how, what, how is your day? And I said, good, how, how are you doing? She just said, okay. And I said, why just okay? And she wouldn't tell me. And at the end, then when I was leaving, I said, well, hopefully your day is going to be better than okay. How should I pray for you? Change their demeanor. Sometimes that little simple question will change a person's demeanor dramatically. How should I pray for you? So I leave that with you today. Think about it. When you encounter other people, how should I pray for you? Getting involved in people's lives is very messy. And I'll tell you that up front. My wife and I got involved in a family from our church. A um, girl had been abused by her grandfather. She's out of control, teenager. 
and I'm an elder in the church, and the parents didn't know what to do, so we said, we'll take her in. I got an alarm system. She can't escape. And we did that. That was very messy. She cut her wrist. We had to take her to the hospital. And we um, had to get her in a psych ward for a while. And the people asked us, well, you know, who's going to pay this bill for your daughter? And I said, she's not our daughter. Well, what are you doing? And so we explained how it came about. And they were stunned that church, church family would help somebody like that and do the things that we did. I said, her parents are on the way. They'll take care of the bill. But they had never seen the church operate that way. This is what we're called to do. If we operate that way, showing the love of Christ by getting messy, it changes things. It changes how people see the world. That same Jackie that I talked about who uh, was a freshman and took her team to the state championship, she played professionally overseas. And, uh, but in college, we get a phone call from her and my wife's talking to her and she's crying and they're crying and I'm wondering what in the heck's going on. One of her teammates out of California um, had a girlfriend and we didn't pick up on that right away. She says, mom, she has a girlfriend. Oh, and so her daughter had kind of witnessed to her and so she broke off the relationship. The girl comes to them at the break, at the, the uh, Thanksgiving break, threatens to commit suicide in their apartment. She holds it together, calls the campus phone number for that type of emergency. Nobody's there because everybody's gone for the holiday because the basketball players, as you know, got to stay to play. So she calls 911, gets help for the girl, does everything she needs to do, calls home, and then she loses it. But that's getting involved in lives of people. That's what we're called to do. Oh, yeah. She, uh, my wife asked Jackie, she said, do you need to come home? And she said, no. She said, Mom, if I come home, who's going to be here for, here for D, the girl that played on the basketball team with her? So she understood that she had to stay for that girl's benefit. And so that's what it means. That's leadership in action is when we take people to a future that they may not be able to see right away. And we understand that it takes a while for them to be able to believe and to see. But we take them to the future and then we work with them today just one day at a time to get a commitment to work towards that future. That's how we change lives. That's how we make an impact. If you look at, I'll leave this with you because we're almost out of time. As I said, I'm from East Chicago. There were five of us that hung out together. My brother, and three other people. We were all successful primarily because we all went to church, but even as important as that was, all our dads were at home. And back then, I was afraid of some of the other guys' dads more than I was my own dad. And my dad told me this in a nonchalant way, and if you knew my dad, he played football, middle linebacker, and most linebackers are mean anyway, let alone the middle linebacker. He said to me, if you ever get arrested, you better pray I don't come and get you. And I took that very seriously. <coughs> I'm, in, I'm in a place where, uh, <coughs> excuse me, after Martin Luther King got assassinated, we're coming back from a football game. <coughs> I'm with a bunch of guys, and one guy screams, how mad he is about what's taking place, he starts breaking windows out. <coughs> and I just happen to be there, and before long, you know who shows up? Police. And that little voice in my head said, if you ever get arrested, 
you better pray I don't come get you. Fortunately, I was a track person. And so when they came, I took off, and I could hurdle the, the hedges very easily. And there was no way they were catching me. <laughs> but that, my friends were the same way. And if my dad had called one of their dads, they knew how bad it would be. And so we miss that now, I think, in our community, that type of community uh, connection. And I told my son, the other conversation I had with my son was this. <clears throat> and this is even before I knew how bad the stats were on babies being born out of wedlock. So when he was a teenager, and I told him, I said, I do not want to hear or see you bring a child into this world. There is no way a girl can force you to do something. So, and that's all I said, and he got the message. So my, my dad came out of me talking to him. And it didn't happen, and he is a very strong believer. And he works, I can't tell you what he does, because he's uh, special forces for this country. Any questions? No questions? Well, thank you for your time. I hope you got something beneficial out of it. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for being here with us. And thanks, everyone, for your attendance today. Let me close this in prayer before you go on with your day. Gracious God, thank you for the words that have been shared uh, from Sam's heart today. Uh, Lord, help us to see your, your kingdom as you want it here on earth. Help empower us to be your agents of change. And help us to always pursue your, your mind, the mind of Christ. May it guide each of us in the decisions we make each day, in the account, encounters that we have with others in every day, that uh, everything be given to you, to your honor and to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.